Hello class, this is Mrs. Cribb. I am recording this session so because uh, I'm not going to be there, but you know what, matter what, even if you watch it later, you're going to have it. And this is the lecture on Chapter 4A, so you need to have pu pulled out your notes um, and printed them out. I will have either emailed them to you or you can find them on, on RIMWED. Um, first, I want to start off showing you a couple of things. This is the Prezi for Chapter 4 and it includes a study stack that I'm pointing to right here. Of course you can click on that study stack and it'll have all the terms that you'll need. And there's another Prezi, this one right here is called the Atom Model. And inside this Prezi will be a lot of uh, videos that I would like you to watch to correspond to what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so let's go back to the original Prezi and start going. So this is the chapter 4 notes and it should look like this except you're not going to have all these lovely pictures. So the development of the atomic model, we're going to start off with the scanning tunneling microscope which kind of helps us to see atoms. Um, it really shows the surface of the objects. It looks something like this, you know, this is just a graphic depiction. And when they do that, they, you can, they can kind of tell you where the atoms might be. It's not like you're seeing an atom really well, but you get a better idea. So this is a real image that you might get from a scanning tunneling microscope. Now, oops, went too far. Democritus. Democritus was a Greek philosopher and he and, and uh, Aristotle lived about the same time. Um, we don't, you don't need to know the exact dates of when they lived or anything. Around 460 to 370 BC, just those, that general area is the time frame. I'm just asking you to remember who they are. Democritus said that uh, matter contained particles that do not, that could not be divided infinitely without losing their properties. This later became the particle theory of matter. He's the one that term that coined the term atomos, where from that's where we get the term atom from. It just meant the smallest particles, and he believed that these small particles that when you had when you got down to them, there would be space between those particles. Now Aristotle ended up um, coming up with the idea that we that was the continuous theory of matter. This theory states that matter could be con continually or continuously subdivided without end and without changing the properties. There'd be no space between the particles. Now we know this is not true because if you keep trying to divide things, eventually you get down to molecules and you divide a molecule one more time, you have atoms. So an atom is not a molecule, they have very different properties. So Aristotle believed this, he was a big deal, he, everybody believed him for about 2,000 years. And then the first real experimental support for the existence of atoms was obtained in the 1700s. Now the law of definite composition. That, that law says that every compound is formed of elements combined in specific ratios by mass. A ratio just like, you know, two to three. Two girls to every three boys or three boys to every two girls, something like that. That's a ratio. So if, an example is if you have nine grams of water, it always gives you, now it says nine grams of oxygen and one gram of hydrogen. Obviously that should be eight grams of oxygen as it is right here. So eight grams of oxygen and one gram of hydrogen. So I'm going to pull up the notes that you have so I can write on them and we can correct that little error. Here, let me get a different color here. All right, so this should be eight. And here's it showing you the ratio, the ratio. Nine grams of H2O gives you eight grams of oxygen and one gram of hydrogen. So if I have 18 grams of water, that's twice as much, then the ratio has to stay the same. So eight times two would be 16 grams of oxygen and one times two is two grams of hydrogen. So we can fill in more blanks. The ratio has to stay identical. If I have 24 grams of oxygen, 24, that's eight times three to get to 24. So one times three would be three and nine times three is 27. It always equals to one another. So that's all it's saying, that the ratios would stay identical. All right. The first uh, experimental model, Dalton's atomic model, um, the atom is indivisible space with uniform density. All atoms of the same element have the same mass. That means all gold atoms all weigh the same amount um, or have the same mass. All atoms combined, atoms combined in fixed ratios to form compounds. And that's what uh, the fixed ratio like H2O for water or um, CO2 for carbon dioxide. The atoms formed in fixed ratio CO2 is the ratio two oxygens to every one carbon. H2O is the fixed ratio two hydrogens to every one oxygen. So that's Dalton's model. And if I go back, 
over here. There's a picture of Mr. Dalton and um, his model here. And I'm going to also go to the Atom model for just a moment. Here's that other um, Prezi that if we were in class I would be able to show you all the videos but the, the audio won't pick up here. Now this one also contains the study stack that you need for um, the different terms for this class. And it goes through each one. Now I showed this in physical science so there you ignore, ignore those guys. And then um, this is Dalton right here and th this is a good video but you can't hear the audio too well on this particular thing. So just go back and watch these videos. All right, we're going to go on to our next one. So back to chapter four. Now, the discovery of the electron, Thompson's model, J.J. Thompson. First, we want to note that Alessandro Volta invented the electrical battery in 1800, and that allows scientists to study how matter behaves in the presence of an electric current. So it wasn't even possible until this. Scientists discovered, now Volta, think about volts, okay? That might help you to remember him. Scientists discovered cathode rays. They, those are emissions from the cathode tube, which is the negative, the, the cathode, yeah, cathode um, end. That's the negative electrode. Not the cathode tube, but the cathode electrode in a discharge tube. Okay. All right, now this one here says, see video on, on the Prezi for Chemistry 4A, the atom model changes. That's what I have here, the atom model changes. And so here's J.J. Thompson. And this is a great video, but again, you need to go back and watch this one. You'll get to see, they'll explain a little bit how Thompson created everything. This is the, the discharge tube that he used. Notice that um, the plate was charged with a negative charge. This one was a positive charge. So since opposites attract, when he um, let a molecule, I'm sorry, a, a charged particle come out of this just discharge tube, it bent towards the positive plate. Well, since opposites attract, that means this thing that was coming out was negatively charged. And that is how he figured out that there was something negative inside the atom. And those negative charges ended up being the electrons. And so now the atom was no longer just one solid sphere. It had negative little spots in it. Those negative plums are the electron plums. And the rest of it was positive positive goop, not really, it's not a solid ball of positive, um, it's just that everything around those negative plums was considered positive. And in class I'll show you a couple of models that some of my students have made in the past. So he ended up with the plum pudding model and I also refer to that as the um, chocolate chip cookie model because those plums kind of look like um, chocolate chips inside a chocolate chip cookie. So I'm, I'm going back and forth here because I'm trying to find exactly which device I want to look at or which uh, Prezi I want to look at. So here's another one. The big positive sign there just means that whole thing is positive and each one of those little dots are the negative electrons. So again, uh, J.J. Thompson. Um, now that we knew we had electrons, we had to have this new model. The atom is neutral is still neutral so we have positive and negative parts that have to cancel each other out. The negative electrons and the rest of this stuff is positive. Those are not positive particles. That's just showing you that all this blue stuff is positive. And again, see the Prezi about the atom model. Now, so now we have a new atom model. We had a sphere and now we have plum pudding or chocolate chip cookie, but plum pudding is what you should remember. And the discover now we discover uh, the nucleus and that's going to change thing. Rutherford, um, he discovered the nuclear model and that nuclear model now contains protons. Ernest Rutherford, um, 1871 to 1937, which is, you know, right before World War II, discovered protons. Alpha particles are positively charged with much greater mass than electrons. They're helium nuclei. And Hans Geiger, Rutherford's assistant in Geiger counter fame, you know, for, for radioactivity, designed the gold foil experiment where he shot alpha particles and so here we are, this is the source of the alpha particles, through gold foil and onto a zinc sulfide, this outside thing is a zinc sulfide screen. Um, and this is on page 76 in your textbook. Most of the alpha particles went straight through and they hit the zinc sulfide screen in the back and they lit, they caused it to light up. That's how they know. They didn't see this, you know, them flying through. What they saw was the flashes of light back here. All right, but some of them deflected back this way and this way and some of them even went straight a lot more straight back 
Um, and so the only thing that could deflect these positive alpha particles would be other positive particles. And think about it. Think about a magnet. If you put a north side of a magnet to another north side of a magnet, they push away from each other. Um, that's what happened here. The two positives repel because like charges repel. And so that means that the atom could not have been um, a big solid sphere, I mean a big solid mess of positive goop with tiny electrons. There had to be a, a, a concentrated sphere. Otherwise all of them would have gone straight back or all of them would have deflected. So they did a little bit of both. There was a concentrated in middle that deflected and then there was a lot of empty space between the nucleus and the electrons that allowed the alpha particles to go straight through. Okay, uh, wait a minute. I really wanted you to look at right here. There's the alpha particles. The alpha particle has two positive protons and two neutral neutrons. So it's a pretty heavy particle itself. Now let's look back here at the, the next one, the uh, atom model. This is where we talk about J.J. Thompson. Now, I think physical science question ignore. Okay, there again, you're going to watch that YouTube video. Here's the gold foil experiment again. There's the alpha particles, two positive protons, two neutral neutrons. The source shooting the particles through the gold. Most of them went straight through to the back, but some were deflected. And so now what we have is a center nucleus of the atom and the electrons that are um, around the atom no, in no particular orbit at this point, okay? Um, Rutherford's model has a nucleus, but it doesn't have super orbitals like planet, planetary orbitals like you might think of. They're just randomly spaced, okay? And so this is what it usually looks like when we get to Rutherford's model. After James Chadwick um, figured out about neutrons, we now have the center nucleus with protons and neutrons, the gray guys, and we have orbits, but not not really um, planetary orbits, and we have electrons on them. If you ever watch Bang, Big, Big Bang Theory, this is kind of the um, model that shows up in the opening credits for Big Bang. All right, going on to the next one. So I'm going to go back to the one with our notes. So here we have his new model. And then James Chadwick discovered the neutrons. Um, scientists realized the atom had more mass than if you added the protons mass to the electrons mass. So I, I took some protons and I took some net electro, um, new, I'm sorry, some electrons and I added it together and the atom was heavier than that. So he knew there was something else there. And so he d eventually discovered the neutrons and they have no charge and they're slightly more massive than a proton. So the neutrons then end up being the biggest things on the, in the atom. So here's Rutherford's model with a nucleus. Notice Rutherford's initial, mo initial model with, with the nucleus had no protons and neutrons separated out. It just had this positive nucleus. He knew the nucleus was positively charged. And then when Chadwick, Chadwick rather discovered the neutrons, we add protons and neutrons. We define the nucleus. So with just Rutherford, we have the positive nucleus. When we add Chadwick into the mix, we now have the nucleus changing to having protons and neutrons. And I do, again, hope to show you some models in class. So here's the um, relative charges and sizes of the particles. Um, there are more particles than this, but we're not going to go below this for now. Um, electrons are negatively charged. Protons are positively charged. They both start with P's, positive protons. Neutrons have are no charge or neutral. No charge, neutral, neutrons. They all start with N's. The mass of electron, 9 0.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms and the mass of proton um, negative 27 kilograms for proton and neutron. Now the only difference here is look at this tiny difference right here. So the neutron is very very slightly larger than a proton. The electron is orbiting the nucleus. Those protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Now if you had to put them in order, electrons are the very smallest, protons are the second, and the neutrons are the largest. So they're actually in the correct order for mass on this chart. You do need to know all that. You don't need to know the specific, sorry, let me go back to that. You don't need to know these numbers right here. You just need to know relatively least uh, massive, most massive, and then that's the one in the middle. All right, the Bohr model, which is the one we use a lot. Niels Bohr, whoops, let me go back. 
Niels Bohr worked in Rutherford's lab. So a lot of these famous guys worked in Rutherford's lab. Um, he used spectroscopy, the analysis of light emitted by absorbed or absorbed by matter, light emitted or absorbed by matter, to develop the idea of principal energy levels. I, again, it asks you to go back to the atom model changes, and I can show you some spectroscopy there. Um, well, well, actually, what happens with figuring out where these um, levels are. A continuous spectrum is what happens when light passes through a prism. It looks like a rainbow with no line breakages or anything there. Line spectra is what happens when electrons fall from a higher energy level to a lower energy level and, and they emit a photon of light. Remember a photon of light is like a little package of light and it has a wavelength and it has a certain color. All elements have their own line spectra. You can see that on page 80 in your textbook. And then principal energy levels are levels in which the, the electrons orbit the nucleus. Electrons want to orbit in the lowest energy level possible because everything in nature is lazy, wants to use as little energy as possible. When all the electrons are in the lowest energy level, they occupy, they can occupy, that's the ground state. Um, think about standing on the ground and jumping up and down steps. Um, this jumping requires absorbing or releasing a certain quantity of energy. And um, releasing quantities of energy released quantity, quantities are called the photons. So a photon is that energy that's leaving and they have a certain wavelength of light depending on how far they are from the nucleus. So here we have a picture. We have the central nucleus here. N1 stands for the first energy level. N2 stands for the second energy level. And N3 stands for the third energy level. And here we have electrons. This electron is falling down from the third energy level down to the first energy level, which is the lowest ground state for that electron. It, it, in order to lose that extra energy, it has to get rid of it and it emits it as light. And um, that light has a certain wavelength and a certain color. And here, um, in order for an electron to get from a lower, think about it as a stair steps, to go from step number two to step number three, you have to you know, bend your knees and jump. And bending your knees is, is loading up the energy and then jumping to the next level. So bending your knees is, absorb, is absorbing the energy and then the actual jumping gets you to the next energy level or the next step. Okay, so you, you suck in the energy to go up to a higher level, you get rid of the energy to drop back down to the lower level. Okay, so let's look at the atom model. Niels Bohr, there he is. By the way, all these guys who worked in Rutherford's lab, if you ever watch that movie, um, shoot, Oh, well, I'll think about it in a minute, and I'll tell you. Okay, here's a same example. N1, the first energy level, N2, the second, and N3, the third. Oh, wait a minute, go back, I didn't. This formula right here, E equals, um, it looks like an HV, but it's Planck's constant. Uh, this is going to be used by the honor students, so they're going to have to figure out the actual energy of these photons of light. So I'll give you those notes later. This is the ground state of this particular electron. And um, it started off up here. Normally these little lines that come off of it represent the extra energy that it has. So this is an excited electron. That's what you call it when it has extra energy. It's excited. And that extra energy gets let go of as this photon of light when it falls down to its ground state. So the Bohr model ended up, because of that, because of all those uh, electrons coming out and the photons of light, the Bohr model um, gave us the planetary. The Bohr model is the planetary model, where we have two, uh, po I'm sorry, a maximum of two electrons in this first energy level, and a maximum of eight electrons in the second energy level. This one only has one, two, three, four, five electrons, but it could have eight and six, seven electrons. So this is an atom that has seven electrons or seven protons because neutral atoms have the same number of electrons as protons. And you can look on the periodic chart and figure out which one it is. All right, so the first energy level can have two, the second can have eight, and the third can have 18. Um, notice that's two plus eight is 10, plus eight more is 18. So we added eight. Now I'm gonna require um, you know a little bit more than this, but we'll cover all that in 4b. All right, the last part of atom models is the quantum model. 
And for non-honor students, all you need to know is that there is a quantum model. This quantum model um, talks about electron acts as a wave and a particle. De Bray's or de Broglie's, I think it's de Bray's hypothesis. If waves could behave like particles, then particles could behave like waves. So everybody needs to know this. Whether an object acts as a particle or as a wave depends on how the object is observed. All forms of matter act like waves. Students act like waves. Baseballs act like waves and particles. So that's what his pol um, hypothesis is. If waves could behave like particles, then particles could behave like waves. Honor students are going to have to see additional notes on this equation. Um, orbitals, the quantum model gave us orbitals and it describes the path of electrons around the nucleus are more like probabilities. Um, look on page uh, 91 in your textbook and see that figure. And there's something else too, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It is impossible to know both the energy or momentum, really it should be say energy and momentum, and the ex um, exact position. I guess energy or momentum and the exact position of an electron at the same time. You can't know how fast the electron's going and um, exactly where it is at the same time because you have to stop it to know where it is. And as soon as you stop it, you don't know how fast it was going. So it's one or the other. And because of that, we don't know exactly where our electrons are. And so taking our atoms apart and transporting them to another location is not really possible because we didn't know where they were, so we don't know how to put them back together. And so if you ever watch Star Trek, which obviously I do, they have something in the TV show called the Heisenberg, um, Heisenberg Compensator. And it's honoring this idea right here, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Um, and we have to compensate for the fact we don't know where the electrons are. So that's where this picture is coming from. They're being transported, their molecules are supposedly being taken apart, and they're going to be put back together in another location. However, if we don't know where they started off with, this would not, um, this is definitely not a reality. But science fiction, you know, can do all things. All right, so here's just a summary of the models. Dalton's billiard ball or solid sphere model, plum pudding for Thompson with the negative electrons, that's why they have circles around them in a different color. And then the big positive goop. Rutherford's model with a positive nucleus and the electrons going around the um, atom, but not in defined orbits like in Bohr's model. Bohr's planetary model. Now remember, in these nucleus nuclei now, there are positive protons and neutral neutrons. And then the quantum model, where it looks like this, probabilities. Okay. And then that brings us to 4B, and we're going to cover 4B on the next day. Let's go back to this, the quantum model. Again, this is an awesome video. You may have already seen it in physical science, but you're going to watch it again. It has to deal with going down to the quantum level. The quantum model is a probability. Now, you must know this probability picture here with probability cloud. The darker the area is, the more, like, more likely it is to find the electron in that spot. So it's really likely to find the electron down here, and it's also more likely to find the electron right here. And what you'll notice is electrons can be in between and outside, but the strongest probability makes these levels, and those levels correspond to energy level 1 and energy level 2. Okay, so you must know this probability cloud that is formed for the quantum model. This is what the quantum model looks like for energy levels. The first energy level is this inner circle right here. The second energy level is this circle plus these p orbitals. And we're going to cover s and p and d orbitals um, um, soon, like I'll cover them in class and have some pictures and some balloons for you to look at. Like the third energy level is a larger sphere looking level, but it will also have these s and p. The s is this, the p looks like this. this looks like a dumbbell, a P looks like a dumbbell. So these are now orbitals. Notice it doesn't look like planetary um, orbitals. It doesn't look like a planet orbiting a sun anymore. It's very weird looking. The D orbitals look like this. So this is one D orbital, not four or two. That's one D orbital. That's a, a second one, third one, fourth one, and fifth one. There are five D orbitals. 
and they are very strange and I can't physically make those just because of things like this. This is really weird. The F orbitals get even worse. There are um, all these F orbitals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven F orbitals. That is one orbital. The orbital, every orbital can only contain up to two electrons. So the F orbital can, can, can contain 14. And then we have the principal energy levels. And I want you to watch this video down here again. Um, so we're not going to watch it now, but you'll watch it later. And then evidence for energy levels in atoms comes from the line spectra, which I mentioned in your notes. <clears throat> this is a continuous spectrum. It looks like a constant rainbow and there's no breaks in it. One color fades into the other. And this is a line spectrum. There are big breaks. Okay. What, what this is showing you is every, the electrons when they were jumping up and down were letting go of the extra photons and some of them were this color and some of them were this color and some were this color and this, but there's not in-betweens. And that has to do with thinking about jumping up and down stairs. You can't jump up to step two and a half. It's either step two or step three or step one. There's no in-between. So that cuts out. That's, that gives you this line spectrum area and that's where they knew that uh, the electrons were in certain spots. Certain quantities of energy were available. This is more about the line spectrum and it's just trying to equate the jump. From here to here gave you this blue color. This is the continuum spectrum and then what you have here actually have an absorption spectrum. You have what you do here is see what colors got absorbed. So here we're absorbing the blue and that's the energy this electron needs to go from this energy, I mean from the lower energy level up to the higher energy level. And when it lets go of that energy, it lets go of the blue. So here it sucks in the blue energy to go from lower energy, um, looks like energy level two to four. Here it lets go of that energy. And then when it lets go, it falls back down. This electron here, okay, goes way out to there. To suck, to go from this lower level all the way up here, it has to suck in the extra energy. You know, bend your knees and jump. Suck in the extra energy. The energy it sucks in is this color here. It sucks in the purple energy. To go back down from the high energy level to the low energy level, it lets go of that purple energy. Okay, and. Here's a couple of examples. Sodium's line spectrum, the energy that its electrons let go of, have this one color. Mercury has all these colors, lithium and hydrogen. So every atom has its own line spectrum and it. Think of it as a fingerprint of the atom and that's how they can identify what kind of atom it really is. And this video talks about it as well. So you need to go back and watch that. And here's some more, just some more examples of there's no sound, but we can watch this one real quick. They're passing some light through a grating and, and um, it's going to show you the wavelengths. First, hydrogen. They pass the light through a grating and then this is the hydrogen and it's showing you the lines that hydrogen is giving off, causing you to be able to see the line spectra of hydrogen. So light from hydrogen consisted of only a few specific wavelengths. Helium. Those electrons gave off their photons and it gives off all these different wavelengths of photons or different colors of light. And you can see all of those. All right, so I'm not going to watch all of that. You can watch the rest of it yourself. And oh, this, this is the one you watched in physical science. You're going to have to watch it again on the quantum model. All right, quarks, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, I did we I did tell you that you have to know a little bit more that that we're only going to start off with electrons, protons and neutrons, but we are going to introduce quarks. Um this is the video on it which you're going to go back and watch. Of course, I got all of them are videos, I guess, or at least a bunch of videos. Let's go back down to this quarks. You can have up and down quarks. And what I want you to know are these basic ideas, the proton and the neutron, not the antiproton and this one right down here. Um, a proton has two up quarks and a down quark. So in other words, a proton is not a solid thing either. Two up quarks and one down quark. A neutron has two down quarks and one up quark. When you add these together, you have three up quarks and three down quarks. That kind of, um, you can just see that it helps uh, balance things out. The antiproton has these little lines. We're not going to deal with all that because it gets way beyond the scope of this course. All right, there's another video you're going to watch on this and one more. 
So there's a lot of videos in this other one. Okay. And okay. So in the beginning, God, no matter what we um, do with all of this, God created this complexity, which is amazing. So this particular video is just all about how we learned more and more and more and understood more about the atom and yet still there's still much there's so much more we can understand. I'm going to go back to your notes for a moment. Um, we're down here. This is now we're going to start talking about quantum numbers next week. I mean sorry Tuesday rather or Wednesday depending on where I, when I get to see you and uh, we'll deal with all those other things then. So you only have to go to 4B in your notes. Okay, good luck with this. Oh, like I said, go to the other Prezi, the Atom Model Changes. This is the name of it, the Atom Model, and walk, go through it and watch the videos. That is part of your homework um, if we're not doing it in class. Look on your particular assignment sheet to know what you're supposed to do. Thanks. See you soon.